So, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah, we always begin in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, to whom all praise is due. We ask him to send peace and blessings and mercy on his final messenger, Muhammad. So, um, as we said, there are sciences of Islam. And so you have the creed, the belief system. And then once you have the right mindset, the worldview of how my knowledge of reality in where things came from, what's going on here, what is my purpose in life and what will happen when I die, when you have all that sense of meaning and purpose, then that should lead you to a spiritual path. In most, most Muslim communities, most uh, you know, learning programs usually focus on learning the laws, the pillars of Islam and the different legal codes. Um, if you don't have the right spirituality, then that legal code will um, be just a set of rules that isn't really a spiritual process. So we talked about the path to spirituality. The first thing is to look at what is the benefits? What are we trying to achieve by this spiritual path? Um, when we read this first one here. Navigating life in the world of body surrounded by the material world. So it goes back to the framing. Like we are souls created in heaven by God. And then we are put into our mother's womb. And then we go through a life in which we struggle with this feeling like I'm a body, I'm a mind, I'm a substance. And so you have to um, overcome that in order to succeed as a spiritual being. You have to transcend the material focus using the material for spiritual purposes. Um, you know what we're doing, the relationship between the mind, body, and soul could lead to health or sickness gentleness or rigidity or rigidity contentment or hopelessness patience or anxiety diligent or lazy safety or fear really that's that's the crux of it is is your attitude and your heart's mind's focus in life how you see things and the way you reflect upon your intentions and your your purpose that affects how you how you live your life in so many ways so this is the, the, the purpose of the spiritual path. Okay, you'd like to read that one for us? This subject is a massive commentary on by the soul and who designed it and then inspired it as to what could corrupt it as well as what will protect it. Success is achieved by the one who purifies it and failure is a result of turning away from it. So these verses in Surah Tashams, the 91st chapter of the Quran, they are emphasizing the entire purpose of life through the lens of purifying oneself, spiritual purification. So God made us born knowing that we're a soul, seeking God, feeling spiritual, praying. Every person on planet Earth, anywhere on Earth has always done those things. They've always believed as such, and they've always prayed. But um, taking account of there are certain ways of speaking and living that will basically harm my soul, will harm me as a spiritual entity, will, it will decrease my spiritual value, it will ruin my potential in the day of judgment. So one who is attending to themselves as a spiritual being, one who is reflecting upon what they're doing and what, uh, what the basis is and why they're doing that, what's their intentionality, then that person will succeed. One who's like, yeah, I'm just gonna, you know, YOLO, you live life once, um, you know, that person is going to just enjoy their materialistic desires and follow their ego and their selfish interests. You're going to find them having problems with the arrogance, anger, um, struggling with what is right and wrong based upon their own personal gains in this world. So that's where we see the, the general, um, like spiritual foundations in the Quran is in Surah Tashems. Which, by the way, God swears eight times in a row on polar opposites. وَالشَّمْسِ وَالضَحَى وَالْقَمْرِ دَتَلَى You know, so the sun and the moon, the night, the day, the sky and the earth. God is swearing by these very profound creations that we all are very much every day aware of and seeing. So that we realize the point that of why he's swearing is the importance of spiritual purification as a way of living. To think about what I'm doing, why am I doing it? Is that pleasing to God? Um, those things, um, you should not be in a gray area. 
You shouldn't be in the inshallah I'm a good person thing. You should be like I'm working on it. I am I'm I'm dedicated to this. And the last one. Oh. <clears throat> Okay, we are searching for true happiness. How do we cultivate it and preserve it so that when our time comes, we are ready? I mean, I'm not sure if happiness maybe is the best word here because what do you mean by happy, right? Um, contentment, I think. Uh, being at peace with life. Uh, that's the goal. Like, I'm comfortable with the way life is and what's happening and I understand the nature of life and I understand where I'm at with God, so I'm good. Like, I'm, I feel like if I die, I'm, I'm ready for that, you know. Um, you may not have all of the best circumstances that just elate you to feel <laughs> joy and happiness in that context, but you know that heaven is heaven and this is not that. Like, that's one of the fundamental elements of being a believer is knowing that patience and perseverance and steadfastness is saying, I'm not in heaven. I shouldn't expect that. Um, okay, so true impurity is distance from God. You want to read this one, uh, Manish? The word shatana, to become distance. This title was given to all who would take this path among, the, among both jinn and humanity. This is why Satan is not worthy of being the deputy. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a pretty gem-packed uh, quote here. So in Arabic, shatana ba'uda, to go away, to distance, to go away from the original starting point. Um, so God is our starting point. And so to deviate or stray away from God, to turn one's back on God, this is shaitan. This is one who is doing that is, is Satan. And so human beings and jinns who turn away from God and follow other purposes other than God and seeking God's pleasure those people um, are not worthy of being God's uh, deputy, God's um, uh, designated representative on the earth because they're away from God. Like they don't see God as the authority in the first place. Otherwise, you always want to look to the one that you see as the, 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 the source of your needs and the source of your value. Um, you tend to look up to that person, right? You tend to want closeness to that. So in terms of spirituality, uh, the nature of satanic uh, life is not necessarily, you know, kidnapping a virgin and sacrificing her and drinking her blood. Like this, when you say satanic, people start thinking crazy, insane, evil stuff. But just simply saying, I don't care about scripture and revelation. I'm just going to go have a beer and you know, pick up a girl at the bar and hang out and I'm not going to rape her. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. And I feel good about that. You see, like, I'm not concerned with what God's law is. I'm not even con concerned that I should have to follow that. Right. That's satanic. Right. <laughs> so, you know, kind of secular liberalism kind of frames things in a way to us that when you talk about, like, I know when I would explain these things to my children, when they were, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, they understood. Like the concepts, you know, they could grasp the concept of what, what is a godly spiritual behavior and then what is satanic, devilish thing. Now that they're in their teenage years and they're, you know, in a public school system, they're grappling with a whole environment that says, as long as you're just a good person with a good heart, you're, you know, there's no, no big deal. But like, so, you know, intentionally delaying a prayer by all of the companions on the prophet, they saw that as a massive, disgraceful sin. I'm saying, I'm talking about delaying a prayer. I'm talking about, you know, the prayer time came in, or Asr, whatever, Fajr. And then you just be like, yeah, I'm going to do some other things. I got to do this and that and other, and then I'll get around to it. But you're still going to pray. You see the point here? Mm -hmm. Now it's like, people are like, yeah, I'm praying five times a day is a lot. You know? So now that, to say to someone, the average person in America, right? The, the, the social influence that we have to say it's satanic not to pray five times a day. That sounds very weird. You see what I'm saying? Because they have decided a very loose notion of religion. Like, you know, for example, for Christians, Jesus died for my sins. So I try to be a good person as much as I want and can, but I'm going to have fun and enjoy life because I was blessed when he sacrificed himself on the cross and so now I'm saved from sin, right? So 
So I'm not required. There's no obligations. I've heard about things that are sins, but like the notion of it being a major sin and it's going to take you away from God's contentment. And if you die in that state, you'll go to hell. They don't have any concept of this, right? Then you have the seculars who pick and choose from Christianity, but they're really ne not necessarily believing in, you know, the Trinity or go to church ever. They're like, I believe in God. But then they just kind of make it up according to their desires. So they're not spiritual. They are, um, I guess that's a, that's the word that they would use. And I don't, I don't want to be rude and not let people say whatever they want to say. But spirituality is something that comes from the revelations that were sent, you know, to people. So even if you go to, you know, India, they believe in the Upanishads and the Vedas and they have scriptural references right, for why they believe what they believe, right? So we have the Torah, the Gospels, we have... So spirituality, we know about that through those people who taught it, right? And they talk about spirituality as a way of living, right? Um, it's not just um, a comfort zone that you like that makes you feel good. I think that's more of a um, personal psychology. Like, how do I feel about things? What makes me feel good, and if I want to think about a God or meditate without thinking about anything, they call that spiritual. But for us, we have a revealed revelation and we know about a miraculous prophet and all of the miraculous things um, in his life. And so we will define things accordingly. Now, is that easy? No, that's it requires one to be steadfast. It requires one to be, um, uh, you know, dedicated. So this verse here um, is from Surat Mu'minun. And so God is appealing to the people of the Quraysh who did not believe in a hereafter. <laughs> so the Arab society, in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, they believed in God. If you would ask them who created the heavens and earth, they would say Allah, which means literally the God, the creator, the all-powerful supreme being. So okay, then you tell them, you do realize you're accountable to God. Yeah, but then I'll die and that's it. Like that's, that's their general belief. Like nobody was saying that there is some sort of hereafter. Um, anybody want to read the translation of this verse? Do you think we have created you without purpose and that you will not be returned to us? 23.115. We are all in fact returning to God. Every moment of every day we are returning to God. We're getting closer to death, right? And accountability. So time is running out. Time is our biggest uh, asset. And how do you, we, how do we use our time? That, so spirituality is saying, I'm going to be disciplined against the urges and the pulls of this world because this world will end sooner than later, right? All of those who met their end were like, no, this is the, now it's over, you know, because they weren't living a life preparing for that moment, right? Then on the other side, what we know, going back to the creed, why the creed informs spirituality, which tells us who we are, what we're doing and what's going on, then there will be heaven. And there is limitless creative comfort and happiness. There is no anger, no sadness, no sickness, no oppression, no, um, no turmoil, no requirements to work and earn and toil and labor. None of those. No rules, no laws, nothing, Right. Absolute purity and comfort with the, uh, limitless curiosity. You know, I heard one guy saying it one time and people got all nitpicky about it. It was like, basically like your own, your, your own God. Like you can invent reality to yourself. Obviously, this is a bad way of framing it. But really what it means is there's no one and nothing that will limit you. And you will be able to share in other people's um, whatever they do. But because you can do whatever you want, it's not like you'd be jealous or greedy. You know what I'm saying? So then there's this idea of stuff, like having more things. So like, like, so there's when there's no money, right? You know what I'm saying? So like there in heaven, it's a matter of desiring something and then having it, right? And everybody has different inclinations. Some people have similar. So now they're comparing, oh, wow, you, this is what you're, oh, you're visiting people in their different realms, which is like a heaven and an earth of its own. Like it's like your own universe, like there's infinite universe is something that familiar the multiverse concept, you know, and you can visit and there is this sense of highness and there's this sense of at the top, you're looking up and there's this light, which is God or God's, you know, representation of veil. But most people say you're looking directly at God as a light and you're feeling a sense of warmth and ecstasy that, 
you know, just gives you that full sense of contentment, that full sense of fulfilled purpose. Um, okay, so we have filth on the soul, just like if we get dirt on our bodies or grease or something like that, we know we need to wash that off. So we have filth. The Quran refers to the polytheists in chapter 9, verse 27, that the polytheists are filthy, right? This doesn't mean that polytheists are physically, uh, <laughs> even though that's the literal, all scholars in the history of Islam understand this as a metaphorical, that their willingness to worship statues, if there's something fundamentally corrupted of their soul. Like what, may, what God blessed the soul with is an intellect. And when you look at the use of the concept of intellect in the Quran and in the early writings, which is what led to a, a, a scientific revolution in human history that then built, built the bedrock, according to many non-Muslim historians, the golden age of Islam, that then the enlightenment of Europe simply took from that. They just got rid of all the theological basis of it. But the idea of free thinking and analyzing and trying to quantify what's going on and how and why and all of that. Um, so this is the sense of, of purity that the believers had through intellect. Like, what is the best thing to do with my time? To sit around lavishly or to try to figure out and understand God's ways and how can I improve upon the condition of humanity by understanding the nature of the way things work and what's happening and, and writing books about that and explaining things to people. Um, so the more you are thoughtful in a spiritual, pleasing God context, then the more you are cleansing yourself. But when you sin, when you do evil, all you do is simply turn back to God and ask his forgiveness sincerely from your heart, knowing that you're guilty and wishing not to do that again, knowing that I don't want to do that again. Now, even if you fell into that, and you know, this is where it gets tricky. The Hadith of the Prophet says, even if someone sins 70 times a day and they come back to God genuinely feeling guilty and asking his forgiveness, then God will forgive every sin for them, right? Now, of course, this doesn't mean that you decide for yourself intentionally, well, God's so forgiving, so I'm just going to go live a life of sin and then go back, oh, I shouldn't do that. Like, if you're playing a game with God and religion now. And God knows that, and you know that. So it's not going to mean anything on the day. There will be no forgiveness for those sins, right? Um, so the, the hadith is not meant to be understood as don't worry if you're sinning 70 times a day. It's, it's meant to emphasize that however much you end up sinning as a serious believer, sincerely regretting your sin, then he will forgive all of that, right? However much it happens. But of course, no real believer would sin 70 times a day, right? Um, so there's another element in which he talks about. Amanda, you want to read this one? Alcohol, gambling, idols, and divining arrows are filled from the work of Satan, so avoid it. That you may not, that you may succeed to 90. So God is referring to alcohol, gambling, um, which are sins, things you do, vices that you commit. And then he refers to worshiping idols. And they used to have this kind of superstitious thing where you, th whenever you don't know what you're going to do or you want to pay for, uh, you know, so they spin a wheel and you throw the thing. And if it lands there, then this is what you do and this is what you get. You know, they, they had that very common about the way the, the gods will, you know, inspire our decisions in life. They also used to have this thing that is similar where you catch a bird and you say, you ask the gods, okay, if I should do this project in this job or, you know, start this business or invest in this thing, then you make the bird go right. Mm -hmm. But if the bird goes left, I know I shouldn't do it. And they'd let it go. And they followed that, right? So, of course, Islam came and destroyed all of that nonsense. <laughs> See, this is so, so that you know, the prophet never referred to alcohol as an impure substance, physically speaking. But the scholars took from this verse. They said, well, alcohol is impure. So if it gets on your, if it's in your food, you have to not, you know, deal with it. It's going to impure. It's going to, you have to wash it off or it'd be haram to, to ingest. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is not, uh, um, physical impurity it's uh spiritual plus whenever the alcohol was prohibited many people had wine barrels in their house so they took them out whenever the verse was revealed and people were sent to the different areas of medina and they read the verse this is now stay away from it it's wrong it's evil then they just went out and poured it in in the pathways right 
So the camels and the people are going to go through there and the horses, and that's going to go along. And then people will come to the mosque. People will go in their homes. If it was an impure substance, like when the man peed in the mosque because he'd never seen a mosque before, he just saw a corner to go into, you know, you know, back then we're talking about just a wall in the desert in the sand. And like they didn't have really buildings in Arabia back then. You know, it's like, so this guy walks in and he sees a place where he can go, you know, you relieve himself. And the prophet then told everybody, just take some water and pour it over that urine. Meaning what? To purify the area from impurity, right? In case somebody prays there in the future, right? So that was not said about the pouring of the alcohol. So for this reason, uh, many scholars said, no, alcohol is not an impure substance in and of itself. Um, so we're told to take Satan as an enemy, as the enemy. Like if you're worried about uh, turmoil and family or uh, people at work or uh, corrupt regimes in Israel and all of this, if those are your primary entity, you probably aren't going to succeed. But if you see those all as just secondary influenced by Satan and that the satanic influence of rebellion against God and turning away from God and following on selfish desires, uh, that's the enemy. And if we're focused on that, then whatever anyone has to do on the outside cannot harm us. You know, like the story, you know, the story of Job, the prophet Job, you know, Job, Job, Ayub, you know. I mean, that's a lot of affliction and hardship. And so the devil is there. Like the way the Bible reads is like God allowed the devil to do that to him. But the way the Quran kind of reads is that God's testing him with this, which is at the end of the day, no matter what human or jinn does, God is, is the one who will allow anyone to do anything. So nothing's happening except for by his will, right? Um, so in that case, the devil is trying to say, look, you've gone through, you lost your family, your disease, your this and that. Look at this, where, where's your God? And he's like, my God does whatever he wants, but I'm going to die and I will go back to him and I want to be content with however he decided to do whatever he decided to do, right? This is spirituality. It's not, it's not seeing the physical realm and whatever I have here, friends, family, wealth, body, those are important. Those will not last. They will not go when you die. <laughs> Nothing's here coming with you. Um, so, yeah, so that's Satan as an enemy. His main is selfish desire. Like what you want for yourself, making yourself out to be entitled in a certain way, jealousy, envy, anger, all of those vices are from self-absorption. Okay. So what is the introduction to the Qur'an? So it's the Fatiha. So it's the introduction to the Qur'an. The Qur'an is a book, right? And so uh, any book will have an introduction that will tell you, this is what this book's all about. Right? This is the general contents of this book. This is what you can expect from this book. Of course, Surah Al-Fatiha is telling you everything came from God's mercy and compassion and benevolence. And that's why everything's here and so beautiful and amazing and serving our interests at every moment and every day. Right, And so you should be thankful for that. You should live in a state of thanks and you should be appreciating and living and embodying that merciful, compassionate way to the world around you. Right? If you're not, there's a day of judgment, you'll be accountable. And so you, you're going to be held accountable for the decisions you make. So focus yourself in spirituality, devote yourself to God, seek God's favor and help and blessings along the way and ask his guidance and stay among those that you know are guided. How will you know? The rest of the Quran is telling you, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is the details of how we make sure that all of that fits. The prayer is answered and it's we are on the right path, right? So the conclusion of the Quran is actually Surah An-Nas. The conclusion is like, okay, this is what you got from this book. Here's what you need to remember about this book so that you are good, right? And so neglecting to remember that God is the Lord of all human beings. He's the king. He's the ruler. He's the owner. He is God. He is supreme. So don't let anybody sway you. Don't let anybody take authority with you, right? And seek refuge in God. Seek God's favor through prayer and seeking knowledge of revelation. So that's, that's what Surah An-Nas, the first half is saying. The second half is saying, and beware that you have an enemy who is a subtle, persistent whisperer, meaning giving you ideas, influencing you in ways you didn't even realize you're being influenced to where you'll start thinking and doing things in a way that are very much in line with a satanic mindset rather than a spiritual mindset that is governed by divine law. 
for which the soul was created, right? Um, so the, the conclusion is saying you can read this Quran, you can memorize it, but if you're not paying attention about the attacks of your enemy, who you know who he is and what he's about, what he's doing, and you're not being careful, thinking thoughtfully in your heart and your mind, you know. Uh, so like some people struggle with the whole, whole heart-mind thing. The whole atheistic, literalist society is like, you know, the heart isn't a thinking place. Well, definitely scientifically we would say the heart isn't like a computing place or uh, impulsive actions of the human being. But we do know that the heart has many neurons and it is directly connected to the brain. And we know that when somebody is struggling with morality and they get anxiety about what they're supposed to do and why, their heart changes rhythm, right? Not like there's, you know, like a, a lie detector test you think will put like a little thing here, right? Because the brain is going to be thinking about a lie. But no, they put it to where they see how your heart rate is going to go. Because something happens, your heart is disturbed when you're doing evil. So that's a lie detector test, which has been made. But if you do a uh, about to do drugs detector test or fornication detector test, you're going to find the exact same thing, right? And so there is definitely a connection. Now, if we go deeper, the heart, and even when it says sudur, and the sadr is really this whole thing. And in the Quran and the Sunnah, and historically, you know, people talk about your gut, your gut feeling. So between the heart and the stomach intestines microbiome, and the brain is a connection that now science is fully post-modernity. Wow, a lot of that stuff actually makes sense when they're looking at it. It's not fully pseudoscience. We're, we're uncovering things that we did not know, right? So the soul is connected to all of these things. But the core of where you are, like when you feel a deep feeling, does it come from here or does it come from here? Sadness, deep joy, excitement, it all comes from here. It does not come from here. This is where you're just trying to grapple what to do, what to say. But then when something happens or when you're feeling why you should do something, it comes from this middle, the sadr, right? So uh, this is min sharr al waswas al khanas. So seek protection from the evil of the subtle whisperer who keeps coming at you. The one that is looking to influence the core of who you are so that he can move on and not worry about you. Because, he, you know, the thoughts you have, if you're like, I see God's forgiveness, you know. God forgive me. No, I'm sorry. That's the wrong. I can't think like that. That's not, I don't know what, what I was thinking, right? You do like that, it's gone. It doesn't mean anything, right? But if it seeps down into who you are, then you will plan and think and you will be comfortable with lifestyles that are evil, right? Evil people have allowed a certain attitude. Like when you're looking now with all the Zionist crimes against humanity, those people have been training themselves to think that this is their right and that no one can get in their way. And there's no limits and nothing that would be wrong for them to do what they do because this is what they have to do. This is what's in their best interest. And so that has nothing to do with anything God would be approved of, but they as a collective have tribalized themselves um, to think as such. So you will hear this phrase in the Quran and you will hear people saying it. You know, we have a kind of a hyper Arabized uh, Muslim community in the world where, you know, if you're new to Islam or you are raised here, you're, you'll notice even people who are speaking English or Spanish or Chinese, that they keep saying Arabic words, right? There's no teaching of Islam that says to do that. Right. I feel like I feel like for Arabs, they have very important spiritual words that they feel like it came from scripture. And so they're just wanting to try to introduce as much of that as possible into English to kind of bring their culture to play. But the non-Arabs, they have kind of like an inferiority complex that they didn't learn Arabic. They don't know Arabic. So the more Arabic words they use, they kind of have this subconscious feeling like I'm more Muslim, like I'm really I'm authentic Muslim. Right. Um, so one of those words is nafs, right? And so what is the nafs? Um, somebody want to read that? Would you like to read that one? Yeah. So nafs, plural nafs or anfus, can mean many things such as the soul, self, ego, the human being as whole, same or reality of something. So this is a very, you know, complex word with many meanings, right? 
Um, when we look about, um, you know, the Islamic historical analysis of it, it's broad, right? Um, so, um, and I'm going to share, I'm going to share this uh, slideshow. I, have, have you shared, shared the other ones? Yes. Okay. Um, but Jackson, you want to read this point for us? Of, <clears throat> of course, there is a huge debate among philosophers, uh, psychologists, and neurologists about exactly what exactly is consciousness. But, but that is just theories. We'll stick to the truth of revelation, which makes perfect sense with our own experience. Yeah, um, yeah, I guess, but those are just three, I think, probably better English here. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, the notion of consciousness. Till now, nobody has any scientific explanation for it. Like, the notion of the I that's reflective of what I'm doing and how I'm doing and is this very free thinking. All animals are just functioning in a very impulsive survival, you know, pro, you know, procreate, you know, protect. <laughs> Uh, defecate, urinate, sleep, work. It's just this very impulsive cycle. It's just a natural, we don't have any indication that they're just like, yeah, this is what life's about. This is what I feel like I want to do. I'd rather do this. You know, why is this? Why is that? There's none of that happening, right? Um, and so just the way the brain operates does not explain that, right, for us, you know, because everything else has a brain. So why isn't everything like that it has a brain, right? So there is something that uh, is mystical going on here, right? So if it's mystical, then we should go to a spiritual answer. Um, so uh, the, the best definition is this internal conscious reality of the human being, which is naturally aware of good and evil, is the root cause of human behavior, and thus carrying the value thereof in the hereafter. So as a self, as a, as a self, our consciousness is a connection between the soul and the mind and the body, right? And so that self is all of that. And the soul is having the ability to be the governing force of the body, including the mind, right? But the mind and its independent brain, like an animal, right? It can overcome the soul. And that's the struggle. That's the jihad. Are you suppressing the selfish urges of desire from a materialistic uh, standpoint? Are you embracing a grander selfless uh, reality? So, um, yeah, the self is that internal consciousness. And we know right and wrong. And then when we know scripture, we have a very detailed clarity. So now we'll be accountable for how we chose to, to deal with that. Yeah, so the soul is, uh, contrary to our Christian friends who believe in original sin, it's a pure. Every soul is pure. You're born. Some people said, well, then why is that little baby uh, snatching stuff from people and, and lying about it? It's functioning on impulse, right? Baby is just an innocent being that does not grasp right and wrong yet. It's not accountable for those things, and nobody should be getting angry at a child for making a mistake. Now, bringing consequences to a child for doing things that are harmful to itself or others is different. But you should not look at any child doing any uh, thing that's, you know, uh, considered immoral as like they're evil, right? <laughs> now, once somebody's seven, eight years old, the scholars agreed this is the age of discernment. So now they should have a sense of accountability that is based upon consequential uh, right and wrong and morality. But up until that point, they don't get it yet. They're not understanding it. They couldn't understand consequences. Um, so the soul is there pure and innocent, which is why you'll find kids, you know, for no reason, if you, if you deal with them in the right way, they'll be very, uh, you know, uh, naively honest about their mistakes. And they will... Um, rectify what they did whenever you encourage it as the better thing to do. But if you bring fire and brimstone at a kid, they're going to lie their tail off forever. You've taught them that I am not dealing with a responsible person who really cares about me and is mature enough to be a leader. I'm dealing with an enemy here who's big and has influence. So I need to hide all my problems, right? Satan is enticing us to be animalistic, to feel like this world is the absolute 
you know, enjoyment. Like that's the goal to enjoy life, to have fun. Um, and interestingly enough, when I was 15 years old, I, some <coughs> weird guy at, at Bishop Kelly Catholic high school, uh, gave me a book called the Necronomicon. I, I highly encourage you not to read it. Um, <laughs> it's called the Satan's Bible. And I had not read any part or anything like that before or anything and didn't until about three, four years later. But it reads just like this, that humanity has made up this false notion of a God that wants to restrict you and prevent you from those things that you naturally want to do. And you should do whatever you want to do that you can get away with, that, that you can enjoy. It doesn't matter if other people, you know, what it means to them because you're you. All you, all that matters to you is you. Like, that's how it reads. And then when I read the Quran, I was like, dang, that's real. Like, that thing was a real devil-inspired book. <laughs> I mean, it sounded pretty corny when I was first reading it. Like, this is some kid making a joke to everybody. That's what I was thinking about it. But then whenever I read the Quran and read all these verses about how Satan entices you, how Satan is in himself, and I was like, wow, that's that's pretty crazy. So, and it's a pretty big book. It goes into all these scenarios and details, and it mocks the history of religion and prophets and all of that in every way, shape, or form. Um, so we are having a self that calls to evil. So if we go back to what we said before, the self is not is not a soul. It's a com combination of the influence that happens between soul, mind, and body. Right. So this is a verse of the Quran and the story of Joseph. Uh, somebody want to read that for us? I cannot claim innocence. Truly, the self commands to evil except whichever receives the nurturer's mercy. Indeed, my nurturer is forgiving and merciful. Yusuf 53, 54. So it's in the context of the wife of the woman of the man who um, took Joseph out of the well, or you know, basically bought him from slavery from whoever took him out of the well. And basically that, you know, Joseph is there as a slave in the house. But according to all of these different narrations and the story, Joseph was a very handsome, naturally well-built, very attractive man. So at this point, he'd probably be late teens or whatever. And so one day the husband is gone and she starts pursuing him. And he's trying to run away, but then she comes after him and then people, you know, find the situation, but then she has him imprisoned and all of that. So then later, um, when she's challenged about it, she admits to the people, she's like, look, I'm not going to say I didn't do that because I had a really strong desire to have a relationship with this. You know, I was going after this young man and, uh, anyone who is saved from that, uh, would be from God's mercy. Um, and so some scholars said, truly the self commands to evil, except, uh, you know, true. So some scholars saying, who is that the lady saying this, or is that God, uh, inserting this, or is that Joseph speaking? Right. It doesn't matter. Like, I don't Sometimes you read commentaries and it's like, why are we getting all bogged down and things? The point is the fact of what's this saying is that we all have a, a materialistic impulse and we want what we want. And unless you are tied into God's blessing and you are seeking him and praying upon him and you're and praying to him and you are seeking his guidance, then you will find yourself ruined and you will be a selfish person following your desire. This is uh, the story of Samiri. So Samiri is the uh, Israelite who he saw Moses um, in the distance. And the story is that he saw like the Burak, like this animal that was going to take, you know, Gabriel's taking Moses quickly to uh, Mount Sinai to receive the Torah or the law. And he saw him leave and he was in, in awe. And so he picked up the dirt where he was leaving and then he told the people who had just went by a village where there was this beautiful gold idol and he was like guys we have gold you know we need something that will make us really you know focus on god so i have this holy dirt right here so let's throw the dirt and melt down the 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 gold and then we can make a you know mold a calf make just like a little calf here and then they made sure that it had a hole through it so like if you 
positioned it in the right way, the wind going through it would make it sound like it's making a noise. Right? Mm, you know? And so when questioned about this, I mean, he was like, I just, my, my self enticed me, right? I was really, I was really just doing something that I really wanted to do, right? But of course, it's illogical, irrational, and it's blasphemous because they, these people have all just witnessed, like they're not new to monotheism, by the way. They're, they're Jews, right? They've been Jews, right? They um, have witnessed all these miracles and been delivered away from Egypt. And now here they are coming closer to the promised land in Palestine. And he decided to do that because Moses left. And he felt like this is like something, you know, that he wanted to do. So we can come up with all kinds of weird ideas and follow them, right? So we have to be careful. So Imam al-Jurjani, uh, Farid, you want to read that one for us? Imam al-Jurjani. Al-Jurjani. The self is inclined to its physical desires as well as its prideful ego. This brings the heart and soul down to the person and becomes known for the bad character. Yeah. So when you allow your mind and body the authority, then the soul, it loses any authority and then it becomes suppressed. And the heart becomes deadened of a spiritual focus. And that's where someone's self is, you know, basically they're just a smart animal. As we're being taught in the Western world, like we're all just smart monkeys that evolved and, you know, that's what we're doing here. Right? <laughs> so we're seeing all kind of crazy stuff being normalized through this theory, right? Um, so that's where you have to be spiritually conscious. Um, would you like to read this uh, translation of this verse? Surely we created the human being and know what his or herself is first to him and her. And we are closer to them than their particular veins. So God is saying we here, obviously, for those of you that, you know, have not uh, become privy to this. It's the royal we. It's the majestic plural. When an authority speaks on behalf of a whole as this powerful entity that represents all that is important. Right. So this is God talking as we. Um, no scholar ever understood this to be that there's more than one God. You know, this is obviously against hundreds of verses of the Quran and the well-established teachings of, of Islam. Um, so when you're thinking about things, God is reminding us, if you start to dwell on sinful desires, right? You start thinking a lot about a sin that, you know, something you want to do that you know is evil, is wrong. And you start to think about it. God knows that you're thinking about that, right? And so your, your natural response should be as a, as a soul, forgive me, my Lord. I seek your forgiveness. I turn to you in repentance, you know, make this, you know, abominable to me. Do not allow me to think and act in such a way. Have that moment of seeking forgiveness, if you don't, then you'll start to, it will go from the brain and it will go down into the heart. And that's what you'll be wanting to do. You're, you'll be driven by the sin that you spend more time on. That's why the remembrance of God throughout the day, you know, like what has happened in our community is you have people that just sit there with a bead chain and they just do it. SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. But with the Prophet, there's no reference to the Prophet doing any such things. Um, in his life, you know, all of the things that are happening, all of the, the sinful, evil things, all of the bad thoughts or suspicions, all of the amazing, glorious things, all of the big blessings. He's constantly glorifying God, praising God, thanking God, seeking his forgiveness for what's happening in the sin and what's going on. Like that's his daily attitude. It's happening a whole lot every day. Right. And when he says you should, um, that there's great value in saying it 33 times. What he's saying is to really get your mind focused on the glorification and praise and exaltation of God, knowing that that's all that matters. Um, and if you're thinking like that and that happens throughout your day, the second a sinful thought comes, it is going nowhere. That is not going to become anything. The more you're in the remembrance of God. What do you think it means we are closer to them than their jugular vein? What do you think? What is he saying?
What is the jugular vein? Yeah, the jugular vein is this most significant uh, vein between the heart and the brain. You know, your life is there. So what he's saying is, your being able to live and breathe is from him. And he's right there with you, surrounding you and filling you with blessings at every moment. Don't get fooled by other than him. You see, don't allow any attachment or desires other than pleasing him to occupy you because you're going to die and be accountable for that. And if you were having allegiance to a worldly material thing that withers away, your desire will wither away with death and it will mean nothing. It will not carry on. Ibn Qayyim, uh, he says, the devil knows the reality of the self and makes it attractive, it entices us to selfishness. I want, I need, I deserve, I should have. You know, that that is the devilish satanic way. Anger, greed, envy, arrogance, all that is rooted in selfishness, right? It says all of the evil, whatever's happening wrong is rooted in satanic ideas. So the beginning of the spiritual path is here. Uh, let's see here. Do you want to read that one for us? Yeah. The beginning of the spiritual path, as God says, no, I swear by the day of resurrection. No, I swear by the self-blaming soul. This is, yeah, and this is Surah Al-Qiyamah, the, the resurrection. So the question is, what is this no? The no is, God is saying, whatever you think is important in your life, whatever you're busy with, whatever is occupying your focus, no. I swear by the day of resurrection. That's what you should be thinking about. That's what should be your motivational focus. That was what you were going. So uh, if you start going back to thinking, I swear by the self-accounting or self-blaming soul. Meaning the one who is thinking, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I probably, this is what I was thinking about saying that, but that's not the right words. I don't want to raise my voice or I don't want to be rude or I don't want to be mean or I don't want to, you know, uh, do this business deal in such a way that's not fair to that person. You know, you know, I'm, you know, I'm married or I'm not married and I should only follow such desires in a legal way to preserve family interests and all that. Like all those thoughts are the self-blaming soul looking forward to making sure you're doing the right thing. And then once done something wrong, you feel this sense of immediate regret and you want to fix it and you want to repent and avoid it again. Right. So these are um, the traits of the beginning of the spiritual path. Now you're leaving this, this basically the soul is taking control over this animalistic urge of self. Omar used to make a very famous uh, phrase. Mahanush, you want to read that? Omar regularly quoted what some say is a hadith. Take account of yourselves before you are taken account of. It probably is a hadith, but it doesn't, when we say that, it's when we get confused. A hadith, it needs to be, this is the chain of narration. So-and-so said, so-and-so said, so-and-so, and that's all connected, and we know those people knew each other. And it's a connected chain and the prophet said such and such or did such and such or approved of such and such, right? So there are some that kind of narrated like that and those have some weakness in them. Does it mean that for sure it's not? No, it very much agrees with so much other things in Islam. So many scholars will say it's a hadith. Other scholars will say, no, it's a wisdom that Omar was very common for saying and it's well established. He would mention in many, many sermons because what he's saying is you guys will get busy in the trade market you get busy spending your day trying to make money and buy and sell and be wealthy and you forgot that you're taking account of some material wealth that will wither away you'll die and that stuff will go away but you will carry on and you have a spiritual worth and that you have good deeds and bad deeds and that gives you a weight to your claim to your faith in god that is the weight will be weighed now, the, the term used is mizan, that there are scales on the Day of Judgment. I mean, there's literalists in our community that say there will be scales on it, but for me, the unseen, you don't know, and God uses all kinds of metaphors. And so God can weigh things however he wants. He doesn't need a physical scale, right? You know, so I'm not going to commit to anything, but for sure, our accountability is based on spiritual worth. The intentions that you made, and then the impact of the, the, the words and actions that you committed to. Um, Imam Hassan al-Basri, one of the great spiritual sages, 
Um, he said, the believer who truly takes care of herself or his self will call her soul to account for the sake of God. Right? If you really, really care about what you are, then you will reflect upon your intentions and motivations. Why am I doing this? What's my purpose? What am I trying to achieve? Is that pleasing to God? Um, let me see here. Um, I don't remember who is the one who said that. This is a this is a this is a saying here. God is merciful with His slave who says to herself, "Aren't you the one who says or does such and such and then disciplines herself?" You know, because the the word nafs is a feminine word, right? So, because there's a lot of patriarchy in the world and a lot of women feel left out, there's no reason to trans. No, nothing wrong with translating nafs. It's actually very literal to translate it as she, right? Um, and I remember hearing this uh, from Tariq Ramadan one time, and I think he makes a lot of sense that, in fact, a woman who reads the, the general pronoun for generality being always translated as a default for male, he, the one who does such and stuff, he, such and such, right? Then it makes a woman feel like she's not part of that, right? So translating it as she periodically um, to because the meaning is anyone, right? And that's you could do it like that. Anyone when they, you know, that's how a lot of people are doing it nowadays. Um, so disciplining yourself with the Quran, meaning discipline means to refine the way you do things. That's discipline. Like if I'm disciplined, I do things in an orderly way because of experience and knowledge about the best way to do things. That's that's a disciplined person, not someone who's been hit with a stick or beat or put in a room. Right. Those are consequential uh, consequences that we create to make someone feel the need to act as a disciplined person in the future. Right. So that's uh, we're disciplining with the Quran. It's not taking a Quran and beating someone over there. You know what it means is thinking about reflecting on it, making sure I'm living according. That's disciplining yourself. That's the way it, that's the way the, the, the text reads. At the end of the day. We're looking to reach that level of contentment with everything, with myself, with my neighborhood, my family, my, and my wealth, my job, my lack of a job, my lack of health. Um, be comfortable with everything God has decreed. Doing what I know is pleasing to God as a natural, comfortable, easy thing. The more you make that jihad, the more you struggle against yourself and against the influences of evil, that's where you will reach. So that's what everybody knew about the Prophet and Abu Bakr and some of the very pious, righteous people. They call them awliya, those that are not prophets, the, 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 the kind of the saintly people. Um, you know, we've always known those people. They just are constantly comfortable with doing everything right. You don't ever see them get flustered or upset or annoyed. They're good. So when you, you know... If you've worked hard at that, then when death comes to you, you're ready for it. When the angel comes, then the angel will tell you, return to your Lord in contentment. Right? Okay, so I think now this goes into a, a different, you know, angle of the process of spirituality. I think we've defined spirituality and why and what's the benefit. So I think next week we'll go into defining the notion of tezkiya, which is a more detailed look at purifying yourself and how to do that in circumstantial things and so forth.